Edith Louisa Cavell, 1865 to 1915. It must have been a pleasant place for Edith to grow up, the newly built vicarage at Swarderston, just south of Norwich. Her father, the Reverend Frederick Cavell, had built the house recently. And there was a very pleasant side to life here. There was a cook, a maid and a gardener. You could play lawn tennis and croquet or play with hoops. There was a pig in the pigsty and horses in the field, strawberries and raspberries, cherries and apples to be picked, and long rambles to be taken in the poppy-flecked summers of Norfolk. Holidays for this staid middle-class family were normally taken in the nearby resort of Lowestoft, an ideal resort apparently for demure professional Victorians with moderate prices. In the mornings there would be walks on the beach, and in the afternoons along to the pier, sunset the promenade perhaps, and in the evening there was the band to listen to, and the pier again. But there was also a very serious side to Edith Cavell's upbringing. She was brought up, of course, in a very religious atmosphere, Prayers were said every day at eight o'clock, and Sundays were unrelenting in their piety. Her father had a very practical brand of Christianity. Meals were to be shared, so poor Edith found herself taking meals around the parish on a Sunday, only to return to find that her own dinner was stone cold. She was educated by her father, uh, because she wouldn't mix with the common village children, would she? She was educated by her father until about the age of 16. In the picture that emerges is of a young, modest, self-effacing girl, but one who was imbued already with a strong sense of both piety and duty. Perhaps she was rather lacking in humour. Well, by about the age of 16, her father had realised her considerable ability and she sent off to two schools, first into Kensington and then to Clevedon, not far from Bristol, where she learns literature, drawing and music, some French and German and the domestic arts. But she'll have to earn her own living. So, the following year, Edith goes as a pupil teacher to Laurel Court in Peterborough. Here, she received training that would give women a qualification to teach simple subjects to young children. The school, of course, was entirely segregated from men. By the age of 18, she is qualified to become a governess. Now, this would be a fairly humble, lonely position. Governesses were expected to be chaste and self-effacing. And her first post is with the Reverend Charles Powell, who has only four children, and Edith is responsible only for their education, their diet, their clothing, and their free time. She is, however, well liked by the children, and she likes their company too. She takes a short holiday in 1888 to Germany and becomes involved with a free hospital in Bavaria. And she must have been something of a success here because she got the nickname of Der Englische Engel or the English Angel for her kindness and generosity of spirit. And Edith, looking back paradoxically, becomes very fond of Germany, and she returns to England with an increased interest, possibly, in the nursing profession. In 1890, she leaves Great Britain again for five years, and she goes to Brussels this time to work for Paul Francois, a prosperous lawyer, acting, of course, as governess to his children. She will speak French to the family, 
but always English to the four children in her charge. And if you like, this was the first cruel card that fate was to play to Edith. Fate plays a second cruel card in 1895, when Edith returns home to nurse her ailing father, and this experience helps her finally to decide that nursing will be her vocation. And so begins her medical training, austere, strict, physically demanding, as it is today, but probably it was even more rigorous then. In Edith's day, there was no insulin to treat diabetes, there were virtually no treatments for meningitis or septicemia or pneumonia. Blood transfusion was not widely practiced. After operations, with the standard anesthesia being open ether, the normal uh, condition of patients was that they would vomit, and post-operative pneumonia was common, requiring very, very careful nursing supervision. Common diseases then were tuberculosis typhoid, epidemic diarrhea, and rheumatic fever, and maternal mortality was high. So she begins her nursing training really on the very lowest rung of the ladder. She goes in 1895 to Fountains Fever Hospital in Tooting, London, as an assistant nurse, class two. And the building has really just been thrown up. It's simply a series of timber framed huts built and fitted out in nine weeks. It's an isolation hospital. It would be hard, often menial work. Well, she survives, and the following year, in 1896, she moves she moves to the London, which is now Bart's and Roy London, in Whitechapel. And here she'll spend the next five years training to become a matron. The London Hospital was a voluntary hospital in the sense that it didn't depend on the rates for its income. A voluntary hospital with a very high reputation. And Edith comes under the supervision of this lady, who has a good German name, Eva Lucas, the matron, a large, purposeful woman, nicknamed the Queen Victoria of the London. But she aspired, Eva Lucas, to turn nursing into a noble profession. She creates a syllabus of instruction. She persuaded the medical staff to give lectures to the nurses and she introduced a London examination, as there was no state registration at the time. And Edith, although she didn't have a very close relationship with Eva Lucas, Edith would draw inspiration from this woman for many years to come. The regime in the hospital was extremely light. 6.30 in the morning, breakfast, 7 o'clock, you're on duty. You get 30 minutes for your dinner, and with luck, you may get two hours off sometime during the day. 9.30 p.m., supper, 10 p.m., lights out. It doesn't leave very much time for any romance, and romance seems to have been singularly lacking in Edith's life. Well, Edith progressed. She passed her initial training as a probationer. She worked in a variety of wards. During a very severe typhoid epidemic, she, along with others, volunteered to go down to Maidstone, where she did apparently sterling work, and she was awarded the Maidstone Medal, which, sadly, is the only award made to her by her own countrymen and women. And then in 1898, she qualifies as a staff nurse at the relatively old age of 33. She does a year's private nursing before returning to the London, where fate plays her the third cruel card. 
we might well have expected it Edith would make her career at the London Hospital, but she had poor relations with her immediate superiors and found it difficult to work as a second in command, often of course having to take orders from women younger than herself. And Miss Lucas' final report was hardly flattering. Edith Cavell, says Eva Lucas, was not a success as a staff nurse. She was not methodical nor observant, and she overestimated her own powers. Her intentions were excellent, and she was conscientious without being quite reliable as a nurse. So she leaves. And she goes in 1901 to St Pancras Infirmary as a night superintendent. The St Pancras Infirmary was an institution for the poor, those basically unwanted by the voluntary hospitals. She would deal with the elderly, the paralysed, the demented, the inoperable. Well, she stuck it and she begins to apply for posts as matron, a sense of urgency increases as she approaches the age of 40. In 1903, she succeeds in becoming the assistant matron at Shaw Ditch Infirmary, where she has her first chance to teach, and she found that tremendously satisfying. But these were hard, demanding posts, and in 1906 she leaves, exhausted and takes a holiday for six months with one of the few friends that she appears to have had in her life, a friend called Emily Dickinson. She returns in 1907, <clears throat> takes a job in a private nursing institution in Manchester, but it's useful. She gains practical experience of work accidents and admin experience as well. <clears throat> and then in 1907, her ambitions are at last fulfilled. A doctor, Antoine de Page, a leading surgeon in Brussels, sets up the first nurses' training school in Belgium, called then the École Belge d'Infirmières Diplômées in the Rue de la Culture. It's now called the Centre Médical Edith Cavell, and it's moved its address as well. Well, you can, of course, readily understand, I think, that Edith Cavell would be an ideal candidate to be matron of this new training school. She's trained, of course, at a leading London hospital. She has fluent French, and she's already familiar with Belgium. No doubt she was delighted but the conditions in Belgium again were hard, but rewarding. The, uh, the school is set initially in these four adjoining houses in the Rue de la Culture. There was no lift. Operating cases were carried out of number 145 into the street and up the stairs to 147. Water, at least initially, had to be boiled in saucepans for sterilising, and either starts out with only four probationers and a handful of patients. It wasn't easy recruiting nurses in Belgium. Belgian attitudes towards nursing as a career were not very positive. It had been seen very much nursing as a preserve of nuns, not a career suitable for nice middle-class girls. Edith has one or two tasks to carry out. <laughs> she oversees, of course, care of the patients and nurses. She plans developments with Dr. Depage. She interviews prospective nurses. She carries out all the admin and accounting work. She assists at operations and she lectures to her nurses. And drawing on her training at the London Hospital, she establishes a teaching syllabus delivered by the doctors and by herself. And the syllabus covers not only strictly medical matters, but also examines the history of nurses, or nursing, sorry, and nurses' life, 
the moral qualities respect, uh, expected of nurses, devotion, loyalty, thrift, and duties to patients and their families. Edith makes rapid progress. Numbers of staff, the staff come from all of the countries of Western Europe, numbers of staff and patients rapidly grow. The City Council asks her to provide visiting nurses for 12 state schools and to provide nurses for provincial hospitals and private clinics. <clears throat> In 1910, the modern hospital of Saint-Gilles is funded by the city, opens nearby, <clears throat> and along with her other duties, Edith becomes head matron. By 1912, the school, in fact, has become the benchmark for nursing standards in Belgium. And yet, despite all this success and acclaim, Edith <laughs> retains very modest tastes indeed. An inventory of the time lists her possessions is simply an armchair, a rocking chair, a tea set, family photos, a few ornaments, a hundred books, a camera, a drawing block, a few bits of jewellery, four vases, a few clothes, and a bathing dress. <coughs> In summer 1914, Edith spends a tranquil holiday at home in England, and fate plays another cruel trick. <clears throat> she returns to Brussels on August the 3rd. Had she left it for another day, she would have found that war had broken out, and it would have certainly been very difficult, if not impossible, for her to return to her post in Brussels, but she does return and bids farewell to her ageing mother for the last time. On the following day, on the 4th, Britain and France declare war on Germany, and by the 20th of August, German troops have occupied Brussels. <coughs> At first, Occupation conditions aren't too bad, but later they become more and more repressive. There are shortages of food and fuel. Brussels becomes a sinister, dark and silent city with a curfew and no bikes or cars are allowed. <clears throat> Either's attitude at the time to the new conditions is quite clear. Here's a letter sent to her family, which was discovered 20 years later in the possession of a German officer. In the letter she says, <coughs> I shall think of you to the last. Is that a premonition? Maybe. I shall think of you to the last, and you may be sure we shall do our duty here and die as women of our race should die. God bless you and keep you safe. To her nurses, she makes it clear, any wounded soldier must be treated, friend or foe. The profession of nursing knows no frontiers. Resistance to the German occupiers grows in the Belgian underground network. Many British and French soldiers have been trapped behind the advancing German lines. And these men are now helped by a growing number of underground networks, very similar to the French résistance of the Second War, of course. The aim, of course, is to spirit these fugitive soldiers across the Dutch border to the north, Holland not being at war in the First World War. And so comes for Edith the point of no return. She is drawn into these networks almost entirely by chance. <clears throat> On August the 13th, 
come to the hospital, two English fugitive soldiers, a Colonel Bourget and a Sergeant Meachin. Both men need some medical help. They have been escorted to Brussels by the underground network, but their guide finds it very difficult to find a safe house in Brussels. And it is the wife of Dr. Depage, Marie Depage, who suggests that Edith Crevel's hospital would make a very good place to hide fugitives. Edith takes the two soldiers in, treats their wounds, and shelters them for about a week. Highly illegal, of course. The two men are then handed over to guides who take them to Holland. Unfortunately, Bourget is captured, though Meachin does reach England. She's now committed, and she shows another side to her personality. Edith can be cunning and devious as she is drawn ever deeper into the escape networks. What has happened to our innocent Miss Cavell? And all in all, she probably helped several hundred men to escape the German clutches. At one point, she has 80 fugitives hiding with her in one of the several annexes of the hospital. To protect her staff, few nurses are let into the secret of these clandestine activities. And Edith seems, I think somewhat naively, to have run incredible risks. Here's a letter of November the 22nd, 1914, to her mother. We have had some interesting work, but are quiet again now. Our people, who left last week, must have arrived safely. To her cousin, uh, in the following year, to her cousin she writes, I am helping in many ways I may not describe to you now. There are many things I may not write till we are again free. Now that surely is the height of naivety. She must have known that her letters would be uh, censored before being sent, uh, sent out of Belgium. The German authorities, who were not stupid, must have realised there were suspicious goings on. She's not helped by the reckless attitude of some of the young soldiers she is hiding, who are allowed out at night and get drunk and make a bit of an exhibition of themselves. She finds it difficult to discipline them. Edith disobeys an edict to register with the German authorities as she works under the auspices of the Red Cross. In fact, it makes me wonder if she really did care. Would it be eventually a relief to be arrested? The strain of these months must have been enormous. But the net tightens and tension mounts. The hospital is, of course, often inspected and searched by the German authorities, who grow increasingly suspicious. She seems to have taken a fatalistic attitude and tells us that if we are arrested, we shall be punished in any case, whether we have done much or little. So let us go ahead and save as many as possible of these unfortunate men. The net tightens, and finally she will be arrested on August the 5th. Edith's office is ransacked, and she's arrested because of an innocuous letter from England on her desk, received via the American legation. America, of course, being neutral at this point of the war. And here I digress very slightly. A few days earlier, on August the 1st, a Philip Book was arrested. In his house were found a large number of a, a, of a newspaper, La Libre Belgique. Philip was a key player in the underground networks and may have been known, at least, to Edith. He's the circulation manager of the clandestine underground newspaper, which remained a thorn in the German's flesh until the end of the war. And Philippe Bock, along with Edith Cavell, 
would pay the ultimate price. She is arrested. And she finds herself in the prison de Saint-Gilles, ironically not far from her beloved hospital. Here's a picture of her cell. There's a folding bed, a headboard cum table, a bucket for ablutions, a stool for Edith, something very important I imagine would be the crucifix on the wall on the top left there, a corner shelf, a basin and tap, and occasional heating, although in August that would not be a problem. The regime of Saint-Gilles prison is strict. Five o'clock, Revali. Seven o'clock, breakfast. Half a bowl of coffee and a bun. Eight o'clock, a visit by the sergeant, who would sell your newspapers or postcards or even take orders from the canteen, assuming you or your family had the money to pay for these things. At midday, there was a meal of soup, potatoes with meat and usually a glass of faro, which I think is a type of beer. At five o'clock, coffee, a bun and cheese. Sometimes there might be an egg and even a piece of steak on a Sunday. And then at 8.45 rang the first bell and 15 minutes later the second, by which time you had to be in bed. Edith will be interrogated by the Berlin Vampires, the nickname for the Geheime Politische Polizei, which would bear some resemblance to the later Gestapo. It means, of course, the secret political police. The head of German espionage, a Lieutenant Bergan, who speaks no French or presumably English, will be the chief interrogator. The translator will be a Sergeant Pinkhoff, who had previously been in the British Army, but had then lived in Paris for 15 years and acted as a spy for the Germans. He would be the translator, and probably, as I hope you will see in a minute, not a very good translator. The interrogation proceeds. There is courtesy shown, but danger lurks underneath. And at this stage, it's important to understand that Edith had no legal representation. And it's equally important to understand that she was made to swear an oath on the Bible. So for somebody as pious as Edith, that means she would have to tell nothing but the truth. She undergoes, I think, three interrogations, but we concentrate only on the first one. She is told by Bergen that everybody has already confessed. We know everything we already need to know. And when asked how much money she received for helping the so uh, soldier fugitives, she says 500 francs. She falls into what in German is known as a kniff into the trap. She admits to having received money for her trouble. She probably also admitted that she had taken in British and French soldiers, and she probably also admitted, and this is crucial, she probably also admitted that she had helped able-bodied men who wanted to cross the frontier between Belgium and Holland. Now the interrogation was in German and French, the word Edith would have used for crossing the frontier would presumably be frontier, which is the same word as in English. However, that is not anything like the word in German, which is Grenze. And I have a feeling, though I could be wrong, that the word frontier was translated into German as front, which means something very, very different. It means the front line, the battle front. And this would carry, as we'll see in a few minutes, the death sentence. So whether her fate hinged on the mistranslation of a word or not is intriguing. We'll probably never know, however. Edith waits 
day after day in her cell. And it's only on October the 7th that the trial, which will last two days, begins at seven o'clock. She is not tried alone. There are 35 accused, which gives you some idea of the haste and the provisional nature of the arrangements. 35 are accused in three groups. There are the guides and organisers of the resistance network. There are the chemists, those who had been responsible for producing identity documents and other documents as well. And those like Edith who gave shelter to enemy soldiers. Edith wears a blue coat and skirt and a white blouse. Her bearing remains proud and calm. And she is led from this austere solitary confinement cell into the imposing Senate chamber of the courtroom. This was a magnificent circular room with red velvet seats, the colour of blood. The walls are decorated with dark wood panels and the ceiling is decorated with gold flake. What a deliberate contrast between this and the cell she has spent the last few months in. Try to have a picture, please, of the layout of the courtroom. The six main accused, including Philippe Boak and Edith, the six main accused, accused sit facing the judges. Soldiers with fixed bayonets stand on either side of each seat. The defendant's lawyers sit behind, but they have no communication with the accused. And remember that Edith's lawyer, who is called Sadi Kirshen, has not yet had the opportunity of meeting Edith. Facing them, as it were, in opposition, is the military prosecutor, Dr. Edvard Stöber. A good-looking officer with an intelligent, brisk manner, an ambitious, fluent and dangerous enemy who rarely lost a case. And in his later career, he did very well after the war and under the Nazis. He died peacefully, aged 88 in 1960. The questioning will, of course, be in heavy legal German and the translators tr struggle with it. The accused, all six of them, are led out and then brought back into the uh, Senate chamber singly. Edith Cavell is first, and she stands before Stöber. Under cross-examination, Edith admits harbouring English and French soldiers and helping them get to Holland by giving them money. Stöber asks, why have you committed these acts? Edith replies, at the start, I was confronted by two English soldiers whose lives were in danger. One was wounded. Well, what would any nurse do in these circumstances? Stöber asks, do you realise that by recruiting men it has been to the disadvantage of Germany and to the advantage of the enemy? Edith replies, quite reasonably, my aim was not to help your enemy, but to help those men who asked for my help to reach the frontier. And there again is that difficult word frontier. Was it translated by the German front, battlefront? And the questioning of Edith Cavell lasts 10 minutes. No more. All of the defendants, in fact, are processed in one day. It was the rush job. The trial went on until seven o'clock, when she is returned to her lonely cell. There is no consolation for that solitary woman, no consolation from home, no comforting presence of Jack, her dog, no company of her nurses. On the final day, the second day of the trial at eight in the morning, she is led back. This will be more gruelling again. There is no lunch break and Stöber 
makes a theatrical summing up which lasts three and a half hours. Edith is accused of receiving fugitive soldiers. And I think we can agree that yes, she did that. She looked after them, yes. She gave them funds, well, maybe. She escorted men to their guides who would lead them to Holland. We don't, I don't know if she did or she didn't. She received news of men's safe arrival in Holland. Well, that's probably true. Her lawyer, Sadi Kirschen, really has an impossible task. He has poor German. He's not actually met and discussed anything with Edith, and he also has to defend, I put that in inverted commas, the poor man has had no time to improvise, he must defend eight other accused along with Edith. Well, he does the only sensible thing, it seems to me. He argues that really it should be a psychologist, not judges who should try Edith. A psychologist would understand how impossible it would be for Edith not to help wounded men whose lives were in danger. At the end, Stöber asks for justice, and a mysterious word appears in the case of five of the accused, including Philippe Bauck, Todesstrafe. That's the mysterious or not so mysterious word. Philippe Bauck, Todesstrafe. Edith Kaffel, Todesstrafe. And it goes on with three more accused. Edith is then taken back to prison, allowed brief exercise, and then returns to her cell to await the verdict, which is not very long in coming, because on the following day, Saturday the 9th, the judges sit and decide that five of the accused will receive the death sentence although in fact it was only to be carried out finally against Edith and Philippe Bock. Most accused were sentenced to hard labour, though eight were actually acquitted. And Edith is accused under this law. Totestrafe means, of course, a death sentence. And this is paragraph 90 of the Militaire Gesetzgebung. And it says, dem feind Mannschaften zu führen. And you can translate it more or less <laughs> back to front. Uh, to lead men to the enemy. The word feind means enemy in German. To lead men to the enemy. And it carries the ultimate penalty. From Friday after the trial until the following Monday, Edith waits alone in her cell. And on Monday at 4.15, Edith is led down the echoing corridors of the prison to the central hall along with the others. There is Stöber, military prosecutor, waiting for them. He reads the sentences like a list of honours, and she hears again the fateful word that you can see, Totestrafe. She reacts rather impassively, people note, but they also note that she is flushed in the face. Later in the evening, a good and kindly German priest, a pastor, a sir, comes to tell her, and he must tell her, he has the painful duty of telling her, that she has only until tomorrow morning before the execution will take place. He asks her, please do not see in me now the German, but only the servant of our Lord and Saviour. Edith accepts the news. She asks if her mother can be told. The sir suggests a visit from the Anglican priest in, Belgium, in Brussels, a sterling Gaian. 
and Edith Cavell finalises a letter to her nurses, the end of which reads as follows. If any of you have a grievance against me, I beg you to forgive me. I have been unjust sometimes, but I have loved you much more than you think. I send my good wishes for the happiness of all my girls, and remember that included German nurses. I send my good wishes for the happiness of all my girls, as much for those who have left the school, as for those who are still there. Thank you for the kindness you have always shown me. And this letter is read every year on the anniversary of her death to the nurses at the Centre Médical. At 9.30 on that last evening, the Reverend Sterling Gahan pays a visit. Edith appears calm, quietly smiling, and she gives the Reverend a kind and grateful welcome. They sit together on the bed and use the stool between them as the communion table. After the blessing, they join together to repeat the words, those beautiful words, of abide with me. Of course, Edith has seen death so many times that it is no longer strange or fearful to her. And she then, when uh, Sterling Gahan has left, sits down and writes simply a final business-like letter to Sister Wilkins detailing the hospital's accounts. The gaslight burns through the night in her cell as Edith continues to read her beloved The Imitation of Christ by Thomas a Kempis, a book that she has long inspired her. At five o'clock the following morning, she is summoned. She dons a blue coat and skirt and a white blouse. She wraps a grey fur stole around her neck. Her hat is secured with a tortoiseshell pin. At six, two cars arrive to take Edith in one and Philippe Bauck in another to the Tier National. We'll see a picture of it in a minute. That means a shooting gallery that had been used before the war by Belgian soldiers for practice. At the Tier National on that morning, she would have observed about 250 German soldiers there to observe the execution. And then her eye would be caught by, on the shooting range, two new white posts that have been hammered into the ground, and next to them two coffins of yellowish wood. There were two rows of eight soldiers at six paces from the victims. Stöber, the military prosecutor, addresses the soldiers and tells them they should have no compunction in executing these two traitors responsible for the deaths of German sons. The German priest, the kindly German priest, Le Sir, Pastor Le Sir, walks with Edith to the post. She is bound lightly and blindfolded, and probably the last words that Edith was to utter on this earth would be in French. Ma conscience est tranquille, je meurs pour Dieu et ma patrie. My conscience is calm, I die for God and my country. At 7 a.m. the shots run out, ran, rang out. The body convulses and appears to fall forward and jerk back upright three times. One badly aimed shot shatters the jaw, blood spatters her face, but nevertheless Edith would almost certainly have died instantly. Now I don't think you can actually see the provisional grave of Edith in this picture. She is buried extremely hastily, as if the Germans felt shame for this execution. Well, the reaction is perhaps not what Germany would have wished for. There is a wave of anguish 
with pride and emotionalism breaking out and propaganda is used to increase recruitment in France and Great Britain. Here's the first of, well, of many slides we could show to show what in fact didn't happen. Yes, it was perhaps a crime des barbares, but I don't think there was a coup de grâce, as you can say, the German officer administering here. A similar piece of propaganda, rather cynical, I think. But for Germany, at least, the law of unintended consequences operated. There was a short-lived increase in recruitment into the army in Great Britain because at this time conscription had not been introduced. However, it was introduced in the following year, 1916, and probably either's execution facilitated the acceptance of military conscription. America perhaps was brought more closer to, uh, closer to war, and Germany, of course, is portrayed as a murderous state. But that's not quite the end, of course, of our story. The war finishes, and in March the 17th, 1919, the body, in a remarkably good state, it seems to me, from the picture, is exhumed. It is then only in May, May the 13th, that the body, loaded onto a gun carriage, is taken to the Gare du Nord in Brussels, where Sterling Gahan conducts a service for Edith. And then it's on to Ostend and on board the destroyer HMS Rowena, across the channel to Dover, where the body is guarded all night at the now vanished Dover Marine Station. One of the guards, incidentally, being a Joseph Gare, a man from Amble, Northumberland. Then the body is loaded into what is now, because you can actually still see the Cavell van, it still exists. The body is loaded into the Cavell van, hitched to the train, and is taken slowly up the line to London. And at all the country stations, the platforms are thronged with men and women. And as the train passes by the fields, men stop their work. Bareheaded, they stand there in respect to this extremely brave woman. Nurses walk in front of the gun carriage to Westminster Abbey and there is an escort of a hundred soldiers to the Abbey. But you won't find Edith's body in Westminster Abbey because after the ceremony it was then on to Norwich in the afternoon. And Edith was initially laid to rest at the cathedral at an area called Life's Green on a lovely spring evening. And at the graveside, abide with me, and the benediction were read out and the last post sounded. The grave has now been moved a little bit closer to the wall of the cathedral. Here's a close-up of it. And if you walk around to the other side of the cathedral, you can see this very moving memorial to Edith Cavell. But I like to think that Edith lives on in our memory. And of course, the most famous of many monuments to Edith Cavell is this one here. There were, of course, many monuments and mementos of her, which still remain in our memory. There were the Homes of Rest for nurses, the Edith Cavell Homes of Rest. 
There are many, many streets and hospitals and schools. There's even a car park in Peterborough named after Edith. <clears throat> you don't have to go very far from here. If you go up to Stanley, County Durham, there's a Cavell place. If you go down to Sunderland, there's Cavell Road. There are many monuments, but I suppose the best known one, of course, is this one in St Martin's Place, just off Trafalgar Square. Picture taken by me on a very rainy January morning. The monument <clears throat> is built of Cornish granite. And there are several inscriptions for king and country. And on each side, the words that sum up, I think, Edith's virtues. Humanity, devotion, fortitude, sacrifice. The white figure of Edith faces Trafalgar Square, and at the base is inscribed Edith Cavell, Dawn, Brussels, October the 12th, 1915. Thank you very much. The End.